Nous poursuivons notre exploration des nouvelles fouilles qui se font donc sur ces sites anciens et euh, donc nous allons après Tel Tainat euh, retourner plus vers l'intérieur des terres à Tsingerli et nous accueillons Virginia Herman euh, qui travaille actuellement avec David Loen euh, sur ces nouvelles fouilles de, de Tsingerli pour le compte euh, de l'Orientan Institute de, de Chicago. Alors euh, Virginia Herman euh, a soutenu euh, donc sa, sa thèse euh, qui s'intitulait « Society and Economy under Empire uh, during the Iron Age uh, Samal ». Um, elle, elle, elle participe à ces fouilles et elle a fait partie notamment, euh, si je ne m'abuse, de c'est elle qui a découvert la fameuse stèle de Kutamua que nous avons vue euh, tout à l'heure. Et euh, D'ailleurs, il y a une très belle photo d'elle euh, avec la, avec la stèle, et elle est co-commissaire de l'exposition euh, qui a eu lieu à l'Oriental Institute, qui s'appelait In Remembrance of Me, euh, une très très belle expo dont la, dont la publication est particulièrement intéressante. Je lui laisse donc la parole euh, pour nous faire un point sur les nouvelles découvertes à Tsingerli. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. And I also want to join my colleagues in thanking Monsieur Blanchard for these kind introductions and for the invitation uh, to speak to you today. Um, so due to the large scale excavations there in the 19th century and today, Sinjirli is one of the best known Neo-Hittite cities. The sculptures that have been unearthed there in remarkable quantity and variety are one of our most valuable resources for understanding Neo-Hittite culture. These durable monuments were a vehicle for the self-presentation of the ruling elite. They show us how they position themselves in relation to their neighbors, rivals, and conquerors, and how they understood the relationship between gods and humans, the living and the dead, and the rulers and the ruled. We can see long-term continuity in the production of monumental and architectural sculpture for the legitimization of political authority and the framing of ritual from the Hittite Empire through the period of the Neo-Hittite kingdoms until the conquest by Assyria. How and why this tradition was maintained is an interesting question in itself. But equally interesting are the innovations and changes that we see in these monuments over time, as this traditional practice was flexibly adapted to new political and social conditions. Another point I want to emphasize is that in the ancient Near East, an image was not only an image. Images were given a power to represent and embody the, the entity depicted in a way that is rather foreign for modern secular society. For the ancient audience, the figures you will see here made the hidden world of the gods and the dead not just visible, but present, demanding a reaction. Sinjirli, meaning the place of the chain in Turkish, is located in southern Turkey near the border with Syria. The city's ancient name, Samal, means north in the Semitic language, Aramaic. Samal was the capital of a small Iron Age kingdom by the same name from around 900 to 720 BC. The first excavations at the site by the German archeologists Felix von Luschan and Robert Koldewey in five large campaigns between 1888 and 1902 discovered numerous sculptures, inscriptions in five different languages and impressive fortifications and palaces. In 2006, the University of Chicago resumed excavations at the site, and the University of Tübingen joined the project in 2014. Our new excavations are continuing to piece together the kingdom's past using modern research methods, with specialists working on different materials such as ceramics, animal bones, plant remains, and metal and stone tools, or using geophysical prospection to map architecture and earthworks beneath the surface. Turkish, American, and European students join us every year to get field experience. One of our main goals has been to complement the monumental architecture and sculpture with the study of the daily life of the inhabitants and the organization of residential neighborhoods. In a city so rich with monuments, however, we could not help but make a few discoveries of our own, one of which, as you've already seen in the presentation by Mr. Giusfredi, has been particularly important for the understanding of the cult of the dead. The early discoveries at Zinjirli helped define the culture and history of the Neo-Hittite kingdoms, although Samal's rulers and inhabitants had both Semitic Aramean and Indo-European Luwian names, and its royal inscriptions were produced in the Semitic languages Phoenician and Aramaic, which used an alphabetic script, 
not in the Luwian language and hieroglyphic script passed down from the Hittite empire and used by Samal's neighbors. The mixture of different cultural connections that we see in Samal shows that we cannot apply simplistic ethnic classifications to these kingdoms, which were instead shaped by mutual cultural adaptation of Anatolian and Semitic populations, as well as strong regional traditions passed down from the Bronze Age. Samal was located at the geographical and cultural intersection between Syria and Anatolia. The city guarded a pass through the Amanus Mountains, and cedar timbers from the mountain forests were a source of wealth for its kings, featuring prominently among the tributes demanded by their Assyrian overlords. These kings built a citadel, five hectares in size, where the royal palaces were located, and surrounded it with a larger lower town of 39 hectares, where most of the population lived. A perfectly circular double wall, equipped with 100 towers and three gates, enclosed the lower town. Sinjirli was originally settled during the early and middle Bronze Ages, that is, in the late 3rd and early 2nd millennia BC. The site was abandoned in the second half of the 2nd millennium BC during the period of Hittite imperial control in the late Bronze Age and in the early Iron Age, when there was probably a local Neo-Hittite kingdom here with its cent center located elsewhere, I mean not at Sinjirli itself. The old abandoned city was then refounded around 900 BC by the first king of Samal, who had the Semitic name Gabar, meaning warrior or hero. Gabar is thought by some to have been the leader of an Aramean tribe that migrated from inner Syria and wrested control of this area from a Neo-Hittite ruler. But it is also possible that he rose to power from among the local Semitic population. Regardless, some of the later kings in the dynasty of Samal bore Luwian names, which may indicate intermarriage between an old Luwian-speaking elite and the new Semitic-speaking rulers. Furthermore, the kings of Samal embrace the Neo-Hittite style of architecture and art in their monumental constructions. Though the Hittite and early Iron Age Neo-Hittite center of this area is still unknown, we get some clues that there was once Hittite authority here from a remarkable site near Zinjirli called Yesemek. Around 400 large unfinished stone sculptures, primarily of lions, sphinxes, and mountain gods, were found ab abandoned on a hillside in an open-air workshop. The subsequent discovery of the wonderful temple of Aindara in Syria, whose facade was completely covered with such sculptures and which was tragically bombed last year, as well as similar sculptures in Carchemish, Aleppo, and Zinjirli, has shown that the Yesemek sculptures must have been made in the late second millennium BC, after the Hittite empire had fallen, but when the Hittite kingdom of Carchemish still survived. These wild and fantastical guardian figures directly continue Hittite tradition. Here you see what they would have looked like when finished, and you've seen some of these in the earlier presentations as well. The female sphinxes have long hair curled at the ends, and the skirts of the mountain gods are covered in hills. The hundreds of sculptures found at Yesemek were likely intended for one or more large temples in the area, similar to the temple at Aindara. But who commissioned them, for which city, and most of all, why they were never used, but suddenly abandoned in the middle of their production, is still a mystery. Several lions and sphinxes in this style, both finished and unfinished, have been found at Zinjirli in the old excavations and also more recently. Two of these unfinished sphinx protomes are here in the Louvre. As these sculptures are more than a century older than the refoundation of Samal around 900 BC, it seems that the Aramean kings of Samal brought these sculptures from Yesemek and other places as relics of the old Hittite or Neo-Hittite regime. As none of them, unfortunately, has been found in its original position, in fact, uh, three large gate lions in this style uh, were found to have been buried in a huge pit filled with ashes. We cannot say exactly how the sculptures were reused at Samal and why several of them were still left unfinished, but they may have symbolized a connection in the new city with the old source of political authority sanctioned by the gods. Next to these, the oldest sculptures found at Zinjirli are the orthostats, upright relief slabs, erected on the facades of the two main gates of the city, the south gate through the circular lower town wall and the citadel gate, which was the only entry point to the separately fortified high citadel with the royal palaces. In the south gate, eight orthostats were found fallen from their positions on either side of the inner gate entrance. Winged men with bird heads flanked either side of the entrance. Two men face each other 
holding cups and staffs, possibly symbolizing an agreement. A hunter shoots at a stag, which is already pierced through the neck by an arrow and beset by a hunting dog. A sphinx, a griffin, another stag, and a lion walk in procession. And two horsemen carry war trophies in the form of severed heads. Forty more orthostats were found lining the external parts of the citadel gate. The two doorways are guarded by a pair of lions and a pair of bulls. Fantastic creatures from the south gate, such as the birdman, sphinx, and griffin reappear here, joined by lion men holding up a hare as a hunting trophy. A procession of two gods and two goddesses exits the gate on one side, while on the other side, three men approach a royal couple seated at a banquet table. A chariot tramples a naked enemy, and a man carries a gazelle on his shoulders as an offering for the gods. Some of these scenes are descended from Hittite iconography, including the sphinxes and lions, the hunt, the banquet, and the divine procession. These hark back to Hittite royal rituals that processed through city gates and included offerings to the gods, banqueting, and the celebration of successful stag hunts. The birdmen, lionmen, sphinxes, and griffins are part of a cast of fantastic protective creatures that originates in a broader Syro-Mesopotamian or Hurro-Hittite Bronze Age tradition. The new elements here are the scenes of military triumph, that is, the chariot and the horsemen, and the offering barrier. These probably depict additional events, triumphal parades and offering processions, that were celebrated in the new city. It has been argued um, by Stefania Mazzoni and Alessandro Gilibert, I think correctly, that the addition of these scenes that feature people beyond the divine and royal spheres indicates that the basis for political authority in the new Hittite kingdoms was now broader and more socially inclusive. The participation of more people in such rituals would have helped to foster a sense of civic identity that was crucial for the cohesion of these new independent kingdoms. The highly visible reliefs representing these events would have been a daily reminder of the basis for this common identity. Indeed, we see this combination of old and new themes not only at Zinjirli, but also in the cities of Karkamish and Tel Halaf in the same period. In fact, some of the reliefs from the citadel gate at Zinjirli are so similar to those at Karkamish that they seem to be copies. They're executed in a different style, but reproduce the same figures, only with small mistakes in some of the details that suggest that the artists were working from drawings that they did not completely understand. For example, this, this little griffin head sitting on top of the horse's reins in the chariot scene is supposed to be attached to a yoke for the horses, as in the reliefs from Carchemish, but the lower part was accidentally left out. And in the scene of the offering bearer, there is a funny shape that appears at his waist. When we compare this to the offering bearers at Carchemish, we see that this triangular shape should be the hoof of the gazelle, where its hind leg crosses the chest of the man. In the Zinjirli version, the gazelle is held stiffly overhead, instead of wrapped around the shoulders. But the hoof has still been drawn at the waist, now liberated from the animal. Furthermore, at Karkamish, these two scenes of chariot and offering bearer are each repeated in a long series, giving a sense of the long parade and offering procession. The Zinjirli artists compressed these long parades into a single block, giving only one example of each scene and making them now emblematic rather than narrative. The artists of the Citadel Gate also seem to have been looking at the reliefs of the Zinjirli South Gate in designing their program. In fact, the South Gate orthostats are stylistically more archaic than those of the Citadel Gate leading me to believe that just like the lions and sphinxes discussed earlier, they were brought to Zinjirli and reused from an earlier city belonging to the previous Neo-Hittite regime. Remember, the Aramean kings of Samal were not direct heirs of the Hittite empire and its traditions and rituals. Their foundation of a new royal city and the rejection of the Luwian language and hieroglyphic script seemed to indicate that they were making a break with the past and would have considered the surrounding Neo-Hittite kingdoms, and especially Carchemish, to be rivals, if not enemies. But they adopted not only the visual and representative idioms of these rivals, but some of the actual monuments of the old regime, to help legitimate this claim of independence. 
In doing so, the new rulers showed that they too not only had the support of the gods to whom they showed the proper piety and could master both men and wild animals, but that they also had the knowledge and sophistication to represent their supremacy in the proper traditional way. One of the most distinctive aspects of Neo-Hittite culture is the emphasis on the memorialization and representation of the dead. This included not only memorials for the kings, which had been common in Syria and Anatolia since the Bronze Age, but now also more prominently for non-royal members of society. In Egypt, of course, personal memorials were an ancient tradition. But in the Near East, um, in the Near East, now we also see a flowering of more elaborate non-royal memorials. There are four main types of Neo-Hittite mortuary monument, standing statues, seated statues, banquet steles, and tower or altar-shaped steles. Only the standing statues and banquet steles have been found at Samal, but the inscriptions on the Somalian monuments are among our most important sources for understanding the rituals and beliefs connected with the commemoration of the dead. These two statues represent deceased kings of Samal, one from the 9th century and one from the 8th century BC. Only the bottom half of the one on the right is preserved, but we can reconstruct the top half from other images. The one on the left, which you've already seen, is not inscribed with any name, but it is probably the founder of the Aramean dynasty, Gabar. His dress is very plain, but he is bearing two symbols of king kingship to mark his status, the sword with its long tassel tucked through his belt, and the long staff, which was broken off, but you can still see the bottom part of it preserved. His status is further marked by the two lions on which he stands, who are held by a kneeling figure. Standing on animals, but particularly lions, is a marker of divinity, which shows that the status of these kings was elevated after their death, as there are no indications that they were deified during life. As Sana Ara already showed you, there are furthermore small hollows in the heads of the lions, which were intended for liquid offerings. This statue was found on the royal citadel outside the gate into the royal palace precinct. Such statues were commonly associated with gates, and it seems very likely that offerings to these royal ancestors formed part of the ritual processions that I'd mentioned earlier. Though it would have been the duty of the current king to actually make the offerings, this would have been a public event. It was not only a way for the living ruler to demonstrate his legitimacy and piety, but also another means of creating a common identity among the assembled public. As participants in the ancestor cult of the king, they became symbolically part of his family. And both Sana Aro and Timothy Harrison have already shown you that the mutilation and burial of this monument and, and others like it demonstrates um, that these statues were considered to be more than mere images, but rather embodiments of powerful entities. Two banquet steles have also been found at Zinjirli, and several more at sites in the vicinity. You can see that while they share this common theme of the ritual meal, they're quite individualized in their style and details. This is the most common type of memorial, and the round top shape probably even looks familiar to you as a tombstone. Indeed, they were sometimes set up at the grave itself, but also in other locations. This stele was found in the 19th century excavations near an empty grave, robbed long ago on the Royal Citadel. The seated person is a woman, although she does not wear the typical veil of Neo-Hittite women, but rather the hat that men of this period at Samal wore. But she has breasts and wears a fine necklace, bracelets, brooch, and tiara of rosettes. This is another peculiarity of the Neo-Hittite period, that women are frequently represented, not only as part of a couple with a man, but sometimes also alone. She is sitting before a table with a stack of flat breads and a fish, and she holds up a cup and a flower. The essential elements of these images that are always represented are the bread and the cup, the food and drink that is necessary for the deceased in the afterlife. A smaller figure, who probably represents her son, stands before her and fans her with a fly whisk. It was the duty of the heir 
to provide the offerings for the deceased ancestors. A winged sun disk floats above, symbol of the sun goddess, who ruled the underworld, but also brought regeneration. So these images advertise the desired state of the deceased in the afterlife, provided with food and drink, and continuing the familial and social relationship with the living. Both types of memorial, colossal statue and banquet stele, demand the recognition and pious treatment of the onlooker, one in a public setting and the other in a more private setting. And this is made explicit in the inscribed examples. You have already seen the new banquet stele that was found in our excavations in the lower town of the city and has a long inscription in the local variety of Aramaic. This gives us very important information about the offerings to the dead and also about how these memorial monuments were conceived. It is also one of the only banquet steles found in its original archaeological context, so we get more information about the setting of this commemoration. The monument belonged to a man named Katumua, who says he was an official of the king of Samal. He says that he commissioned the monument for himself while he was still living, and he made a sacrificial feast. The sacrifices included a bull for the storm god, a ram each for four other gods, and a ram for his soul, which is or will be in this stele. He requests that after his death, his heir will repeat this sacrifice every year and offer his soul a haunch of meat. So we learn from this inscription, first of all, that the soul of the deceased was considered to be in the stele, and this is how the deceased was embodied to receive food and drink after death. The stone and image were a substitute for the body that allowed the deceased to be present. Second, we learn that the offerings to the dead were not isolated, but were instead simultaneous with offerings for the gods. And this harmonizes very well with what we know about royal mortuary cult from memorial inscriptions for the kings of Samal. In one of them, the successor of the deceased king Panamua is instructed to make sacrifices to the storm god Hadad and say, May the soul of Panamua eat with you, and may the soul of Panamua drink with you. By invoking the name of the dead at the stone memorial while sacrificing to the gods, the deceased was given the honor of dining with the gods and being one of their company. This is also supported by the setting of the new stele. It was found in a rather modest building in a residential neighborhood, which seems to have been a special purpose building for the mortuary cult rather than a house and was built next door to a small neighborhood temple. The temple was not very well preserved, but it is a reasonable guess that it was dedicated to the storm god who is mentioned as receiving the largest sacrifice in the inscription on the mortuary stele found in the next room. So this close spatial proximity of the stele to a temple is completely consistent with the evidence of the text that the offerings to the dead, at least in some cases, took place in the context of offerings to the gods. The gods, the living, and the dead were brought together in this important communal occasion of the sacrificial feast. The monuments from Samal also give us important insights into the evolving relationship of the Neo-Hittite kingdoms with Assyria, their aggressive and expansive neighbor to the east in Mesopotamia. After the Assyrians had regained control of Upper Mesopotamia in the early 9th century BC, they proceeded to assert supremacy over the wealthy Neo-Hittite, Aramean, and Phoenician kingdoms to the west. Only about 50 years after the Aramean dynasty and new city of Samal were founded, Samal and its allies were defeated in a great battle on its own territory by the Assyrian king Shalmaneser III. And the king of Samal had to pledge loyalty and annual tribute of silver and cedar beams to Assyria. We learn this from Assyrian inscriptions. A few years later, the son of that king of Samal commissioned an orthostat for the entrance of his palace, whose image and inscription give a local perspective on the relationship with Assyria. The Phoenician inscription of that king Kulamua, um, who as you heard has a Luwian name, although his father's name is Aramean, describes how he was surrounded by aggressive neighbors, in particular the king of the Danunians, who lived to the west in the coastal plain of southern Turkey. But Kulamua hired the king of Assyria to defeat him. 
He says that this victory made him rich and able to share the wealth and create social harmony in his kingdom. Kulamua is further shown wearing the Assyrian royal dress and crown and making the Assyrian gesture of adoration towards symbols of the gods, as you see in this Assyrian stele. Although he carries a drooping flower, which is a Western Levantine motif. There is a great contrast between Kulamua's boast that he hired the Assyrian king like a mercenary against his enemy, and the Assyrian account of these campaigns against the king of the Danunians, which do not even mention tiny Samal. For the local audience, Kulamua has turned the subordinate, subjugated position of Samal on its head, proudly portraying Assyria as his protector. A century later, more new palaces were built on the citadel and adorned with orthostats by another king of Samal, Barakib. Here he is at left, shown in local dress, but on an Assyrian-style throne, sitting before a symbol of the moon god and his own scribe. And at right, you see him seated at a banquet table, approached by attendants. The inscriptions of this king tell us that his grandfather had been overthrown in a coup d'etat, and his father had been exiled. But the Assyrian king, Tiglath-Pileser III, had restored his father to the throne of Samal, and he had become the most loyal Assyrian vassal, campaigning with the Assyrian army, and even assisting in the famous Assyrian deportations of conquered peoples. Tiglath-Pileser III had taken much tighter control of his western vassals and even started to annex any kingdom that rebelled and turn it into an Assyrian province. The inscriptions of Barakib are full of expressions of loyalty to Assyria, saying even that he ran at the chariot wheel of his lord, the king of Assyria. Like his ancestor Kulamua, Barakib credits his success and also his wealth to Assyrian protection. But unlike Kulamua, he is very careful to express the proper subservience to his overlord and would never have dared to portray himself in the dress of the Assyrian king. One gets the sense that Barakib and his neighbor kings were now much more strictly monitored and controlled by the Assyrian king and his officials in this new phase of imperial expansion. It has also been noted that in this period of intensive Assyrian pressure, royal monuments were no longer being made in accessible public spaces such as the city gates and with the themes of cultic and military processions, but rather in the more exclusive zone of the royal palace and with scenes showing the relationship between the king and his courtiers. The primary political concern addressed by these monuments was no longer to unify the population and legitimize the foundation of a new city and kingdom, but instead to justify cooperation with Assyria. By simultaneously proclaiming his loyalty to Assyria and promoting the solidarity of a new, more bureaucratic ruling class through shared wealth and honors, the king could hope to ward off another coup from within or dethronement from above and hold on to his increasingly fragile position. In spite of this balancing act, Assyrian expansion rolled on, and by the end of the 8th century BC, almost all of the Neo-Hittite kingdoms, including Samal, had been annexed as Assyrian provinces with Assyrian governors. Life in the city continued, however, after this regime change, which seems to have mainly affected the upper stratum of society. Imperial officials did not attempt to force assimilation to Assyrian culture on the local people, but rather the greater interconnection and increased flow of people and goods across the empire resulted in the adoption of new customs alongside the old ones. The most monumental mark of Assyrian, Assyrian imperialism at Samal is the imposing stele, three meters tall, of the Assyrian king Esarhaddon, dating to 670 BC. The king is shown holding a cup and scepter before a group of divine symbols. He also holds a pair of reins connected to two prisoners, a crown prince of Egypt, and a king of the Phoenician city Sidon, who had rebelled and been subdued. The lengthy cuneiform inscription in the Assyrian language recounts Esarhaddon's conquest of Egypt, and on the sides are shown his two sons, the crown princes of Assyria and Babylonia, to whom he made the whole empire swear loyalty. The emphatic theme of this monument is obedience. Esarhaddon says, I set up this stele for all time to astonish all enemies. This stele was found at the citadel gate, 
fallen from a large stone base that seems to have been reused from an earlier monument, probably a statue of one of the kings of Samal. In placing his monument in this traditional location, the Assyrian king was in a way stepping into the shoes of the local kings of Samal. Like those kings, he makes a demand of the onlooker. May a future prince look upon my stele with my written name. May he read its surface. May he anoint it with oil. May he make a sacrifice. And may he praise the name of the god Ashur, my lord. I have shown you today developments and changes in the monuments of Zinjirli Samal over the course of several centuries. But we should keep in mind that these monuments were not experienced in isolation. There are some cases, yes, of the removal or destruction of monuments. But for the most part, this was a cumulative process of adding to the existing monumental landscape of the city. This created for the ancient inhabitants of Samal and also for the archaeologists who uncover it, a landscape of memory, a confluence of the ideas, images, and personas of past and present that gave shape to the complex identity of this city. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>